Columbus's calculation of the size of the Atlantic Ocean. During the 15th century, the Portuguese crown used newly developed ships to explore the African coast, searching for a new trade route to India. Around the time when the Portuguese were getting close, an Italian man named Columbus developed the idea of sailing westward, reaching India by circling the globe. His plan was controversial, not because there was any doubt about the spherical shape of the Earth, which had long been proven by the Greeks, but because the Atlantic Ocean was deemed far too large. And in fact, had America not been midway Europe and Asia, Columbus would have never reached land. To convince his contemporaries, Columbus dived into both ancient and contemporary texts in search for any clues that confirmed that the journey was possible. And luckily we can still follow his thinking, since he made notes on the margins of various books, which still exist to this day. And hilariously, we find him here interested in dragons, exotic animals, pearls, of course gold, and also the location of a terrestrial paradise, the Garden of Eden. But most of all, he looked for any information that suggested that the Atlantic Ocean was smaller than was generally thought, by cherry-picking this data in, frankly, unacceptable ways. He found wildly inaccurate results, which he then presented to the courts of Europe. Yet the courts consulted real scientists from his day, who considered Columbus a boastful fool and disregarded his ideas. As a result, the monarchs of Portugal, Spain, England and France were not willing to finance his plans. Until finally there was success. Hey, good to see you. This is Stefan, author of In Search of the Sublime. On this World History channel, we'll trace humanity's relentless pursuit of scientific truth, moral excellence and enlightenment. We'll meet anyone from Mesopotamian astronomers and Indian yogis to Greek philosophers and enlightenment scientists. And you'll meet them firsthand using primary sources giving you valuable insights that transcend the surface level understanding you get on other channels. Go check it out for yourself. Let's start. Let's start with some background information. Europe started its exploration of the world in the 15th century. At this time, Europe vastly improved its ships, allowing them to explore the oceans. And this was combined with the adoption of gunpowder and cannons from China which made Europe the dominant power on the world stage. The first European power to take advantage of these new technologies was Portugal, which became determined to find a new trade route to Asia. Before this time, the Portuguese had access to Asian spice trade through middlemen from Venice and Genoa, who sometimes charged five times the purchase price. And other overland trade routes were also problematic, as they were in the hands of the Ottoman Turks. To solve this problem, the Portuguese attempted to find a new trade route to India by sailing around the southern tip of Africa. At the time, it was unclear if this was even possible, as the Greek astronomer Ptolemy had argued that Africa was connected to the bottom of the world, as you can see in this map. Starting in 1419, the Portuguese prince Henry the Navigator sponsored expeditions to expand Portugal's reach along the west coast of Africa. In 1488, Bartolomeu Dias reached further south than any of his predecessors, but then he got caught in a 13-day storm. When the storm finally subsided, he realized that the African coast was suddenly to his west, and as a result he concluded that he must have sailed around the tip of Africa which he then named the Cape of Storms, and the Portuguese king later renamed it to the Cape of Good Hope. Vasco da Gama extended the journey even further, reaching India in 1498 after a full year of sailing. Being this long at sea, his crew developed scurvy, which is caused by vitamin C deficiency, and the symptoms of which are swollen feet and hands, bleeding gums, aching teeth, and finally, death. When going ashore in India, the crew was surprised to meet two Muslims who were able to answer them in Spanish. And the Portuguese then told them, 
we come in search of Christians and spices. They then managed to get hold of a large batch of pepper and cinnamon, which they then sold back home, and which made them enough to pay for their expedition 60 times over. On a follow-up expedition in 1500, Vasco da Gama began to use violence to assert his dominance over the Indian Ocean. Most notably, his men bombarded the Indian city of Calicut, and they also captured a ship of Muslim pilgrims who were returning from Mecca, and then he murdered its passengers. A few years later, in 1505, Portuguese India was established consisting of a string of Portuguese fortresses and cities along the Indian coast. In time, Portugal established colonies all over the world, forming both the first global trade network and also the first global empire. While the Portuguese were sailing east to reach India, a man from Genoa wanted to try something else. His name was Christopher Columbus and he led an expedition that would become the quintessential voyage of discovery. Columbus was born in Genoa, Italy. We also know from descriptions that he was tall, he had a long face, red hair and blue eyes. Unfortunately, we have no contemporary portrait of him. The images we do have are from later centuries, for the age of great Spanish portraiture had yet to come. According to his biographers, Columbus spent much of his early life at sea. In his twenties he was even caught in a sea battle near Portugal, where the boat that he was on sank, which forced him to swim ashore. And we also read that he went on expeditions all the way to Iceland and also to Guinea in Africa. In the 1480s he became convinced that he could find another route to India, this time by sailing west. Since the days of the ancient Greeks, intellectuals had known that the earth was spherical in shape, but the Atlantic Ocean was believed to be too large to reach India without running out of supplies. But Columbus thought differently, based on a few meager clues and a number of irrational guesses. First of all, he had read that Aristotle believed that India could be reached from Spain in just a few days although Aristotle presented no evidence for this. And the Greek Strabo claimed that some Greeks had even made an attempt to cross the ocean, although they had failed to reach land. There was also contemporary evidence. It was said that a Portuguese sailor had picked up a carved piece of exotic driftwood, which Columbus imagined to be bamboo from India as described by Ptolemy. For the Greeks had reached India through the campaigns of Alexander the Great. Other evidence came from the Azores, islands far out in the Atlantic Ocean, where two bodies were said to have washed ashore with faces that were interpreted as Chinese. And in fact today we do know that a great storm can even carry entire tree trunks over from the Americas. So it is not entirely impossible, although these men were of course not Chinese. To estimate the distance to India, Columbus rejected the commonly accepted circumference of the Earth, as calculated by the great Greek astronomer Eratosthenes from the 3rd century BC, who actually found a number very close to the modern value. He was only 1 or 2 percent off. And instead, Columbus accepted the value from the Muslim scholar Al-Fargani from the 9th century AD. Ironically, Al-Fargani had predicted an even larger circumference than Eratosthenes. But since Columbus had used a wrong unit of distance, he found the circumference 75% of the current value. On top of this, Ptolemy had estimated that the Eurasian continent reached halfway around the globe. But Columbus instead cherry-picked an estimate by Marinus of Tyre, who believed that the continent covered about 63% of the Earth, which he then extended to 65%, believing that Marinus had used an erroneous unit. And of course, the larger the Eurasian continent is on the globe, the smaller the Atlantic Ocean must be. He then added another 8% to the Eurasian landmass, based on descriptions by Marco Polo, the great 13th century traveler who reached China, and another 8% for the reputed distance between China and Japan, and another 3% for the distance between Africa and the Canary Islands.
and hereby he reduced the distance between Europe and Asia to a mere 17% of the globe, while the actual percentage is over 50%. So Columbus cherry-picked the circumference of the Earth to be as small as possible, shrinking the ocean, while preferring the largest possible distance for the length of the Eurasian continent, thereby also reducing the size of the Atlantic Ocean. So basically he did all he could to have the evidence fit his beliefs. We can trace his thinking in the notes that he made in the margins of various books while doing his research. If an author of these books proposed a distance too large for his liking, he wrote down on the side, not so. And on another instance we read, India is near Spain, or the sea that separates Spain and India is small. Hilariously, in these notes we also find Columbus interested in gold, pearls, elephants, rhinoceroses and even legendary monsters including dragons and basilisks. Columbus's next task was to convince one of Europe's rulers to finance his expedition. But this turned out to be one of the hardest things he would ever do in his life. For eight years Columbus lobbied at royal courts. But his plans kept being rejected on the grounds that his calculations were just far too optimistic. Later in his life he would often look back with bitterness at the ceaseless rejection and ridicule that he faced during those years. He made the first offer to the Portuguese king Don Joao II. A historian present at the Portuguese court called Columbus quote, very boastful in his affairs and the king gave him quote, small credit. We read, they all considered the words of Cristóvão Colom, or Columbus, as vain, simply founded on imagination or on things like that Isle Sipango, meaning Japan of Marco Polo. His second attempt was with the monarchs of Spain, the couple Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. But they were at the time busy reconquering Granada from the Arabs. They did allow commission to examine his proposal, but quote, all of them agreed that what the admiral, that is Columbus, said could not possibly be true. But contrary to what appeared to most of them, the admiral persisted. They said that the plan quote, rested on weak foundations and appeared uncertain and impossible to any educated person. Despite the negative outcome, the king and queen did advise Columbus to try again after the war with Granada. Meanwhile, Columbus sent his brother Bartholomew to England, where the counselors of the king there, quote, made game of what Columbus said and held his words to be in vain. And his brother next went to France, where the reaction was also negative. When Columbus was about to give up and leave Spain, a friend at the Spanish court offered to finance his fleet, after which the king and queen finally endorsed his plans. Columbus was given three ships called the Niña, Pinta and Santa Maria, and also a crew of 90 men, and they packed provisions for at least one year. Isabella and Ferdinand also gave Columbus, quote, royal letters of recommendation for the Grand Khan, the perceived title of the leader of China. This was the title when Marco Polo visited China, when China was ruled by the Mongols, and also for all the kings and lords of India. Columbus described his journey in his diary titled Book on the First Navigation and Discovery of the Indies. The original manuscript has disappeared, but his biographer Bartolomé de las Casas, who later became the first priest of the New World, quoted long passages. Near the start of this work he wrote, Your Highnesses, meaning the King and the Queen, ordered that I should not go by land to the east, as had been customary, but that I should go by way of the west, which up to this day we do not know for certain that anyone has gone. Your Highnesses gave orders to me that with a sufficient fleet I should go to the set parts of India, and for this they made great concessions to me and ennobled me, so that henceforward I should be called Don and should be Chief Admiral of the Ocean Sea, Perpetual Viceroy and Governor of all the islands and continents that I should discover and gain, and that I might thereafter discover and gain in the Indian Ocean, and that my eldest son should succeed 
and so on for generations to generations forever. And then the journey began, which will be the topic of the next lecture. Reading Columbus's journal, we'll read about the anxiety that his men felt when they sailed far enough to lose sight of land. And we read how Columbus lied to his crew about the distance they had sailed, in order to pretend that they were closer to home. And we read about a number of mysterious false sightings of land, some of which were illusions of some sort. And then his arrival on the island of San Salvador where he was immediately met by friendly natives. So stay tuned for the next lecture. And by now, if you want to read more about these voyages of discovery or any other topic from world history, read my book In Search of the Sublime. You can read it completely for free on worldhistorybook.com or you can buy a physical copy on Amazon. See you next time. Bye bye.